Hi, and welcome to the Little Fireface Podcast by the Little Fireface Project. My name is Kylie, and I'll be your host and guide to all things Slow Wars. If you've been following our podcast this week, as well as the Little Fireface Project social media, you'll know that it's Slow Wars Outreach Week. To celebrate, we're talking with some of the amazing conservationists who work with these animals about what they do. Today, I'm speaking with Brittany Rapone, who worked to develop a protocol for slow loris reintroduction in Vietnam for her master's dis- dissertation. She also happens to be my good friend. I hope you enjoy learning about Brittany's amazing work with lorises as much as I did. So let's take a listen. Uh, the EPRC is the Endangered Primate Rescue Center. It's a NGO in northern Vietnam that takes in langurs, gibbons, and slow lorises that have been, most of them have been confiscated from the illegal trade in Vietnam. So is the, is the pet trade a common problem in Vietnam? Basically, there's not a huge amount of enforcement for any of the wildlife trade in Vietnam. And um, quite a few people will try and keep animals, either primates, especially as pets or as like ornamentation for restaurants and things like that. And so if they're not confiscated by the forestry department, um, sometimes they, people are just convinced to surrender them. And that actually happens occasionally with the slow lorises that are brought to the center is they were um, surrounded by someone. So you told us a little bit about what the EPRC is. So what specifically were you doing at the EPRC while you were there? One thing I was doing there was trying to help create protocol or just an action plan to figure out how to best release their slow lorises. When I was there, they had just under 30 different Bengal and Pygmy slow lorises. They were getting beyond capacity. There was just too many lorises and they needed to get some release. It's been shown in the past that primate releases are often unsuccessful and that released animals don't survive very long. I tried to create a guidelines that would be the most effective in releasing the lorises so that they would be most likely survive after release. The EPRC has a lot of animals it takes care of and it's constantly busy so I was trying to create a physical document and a digital document for the center so that in years to come even if there's staff turnover like there has been a lot in recent years that the the centers will still be able to have Uh, a concrete protocol of the best methods to release the lorises so hopefully they don't get this buildup again of so many in their care. And is that just center specific? Um, the, The guidelines I was working on I tried to have them yes EPR specific that was one thing that when I was there was just trying to see um what resources are available to them, what kind of environment they have to release them, where can they release them. Um, you know, there's like uh, government there. The EPRC is actually located within a national park and works with the forestry department. You know, they're not independent and they don't have, they can't just do whatever they want. They have to work together with the forestry department. They are partnered with Leipzig Zoo in Germany and they have to communicate with them as well and so the guidelines I made I intended to be very EPRC specific but a lot of the things I discuss can also be you know adjusted to be applied to other centers. So in your experience doing this protocol development what were some of the biggest challenges that you encountered? It's not just you and the lorises there's a lot of different like cogs in this machine at play there's just a or one of the biggest things is just dealing with logistics even though you're there for two months quite a bit of time goes by just figuring out the perfect place to put the like the camera trap one thing I was looking into was determining making some changes to the lorises diets before they were released the lorises that were going to stay in captivity had diets that were suitable for lorises living in captivity, but for the lorises that were going to be released, the diets that the EPRC currently feeds them are not not a one-to-one of what they would be in the wild. And so before the lorises got released, wanted to transition their diets to be 
more wild. Like at the EPRC, they do get gum and insects, which are essential parts of the both the big bangle and the pygmy loris's diet, but they weren't receiving the amounts that they would be eating in the wild, and they were getting much more fruit and veggies than they would be in the wild. And of course, because they weren't going to be encountering any watermelon once they were released, we had to do things like wean them off of certain foods and add more gum and insects. But as you're working with these, uh, with the keepers who are very busy and have their schedule that they need to do this thing every day at this time, trying to kind of weasel into their schedule and be like, oh, can instead for this one loris of 30 lorises you need to feed today, can you give them this special diet? I would feel like I was inconveniencing them sometimes, and uh, um, so that could be challenging. No, I think those are all really important things to know. We, in conservation, we always talk about a lack of resources, so I think that you've really seen it in action. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, definitely a major challenge. So, also, do you have some some proud success moments that you want to share? Or maybe a, a favorite story or two about your time with the lorises? Sometimes I would stay later and do nighttime observations of the lorises, which was exciting to see them active and not sleeping. The lorises are nowhere near as vocal as, say, the gibbons, who I heard on a daily basis. So. When I observed them at night, one of the most um, exciting parts was actually hearing some of the lorises. I heard them whistling. So hearing one female loris whistle multiple times was really neat because, you know, when we whistle, like we put our lips together and we make a distinct shape with our mouth, but they just open their mouth and out comes like a "Ah!" When I heard that one making multiple vocalizations and kind of ignoring my presence, it was very exciting for me. One of the things that I had done for with the lorises during both night and daytime to check to see if they were releasable was to see how gregarious they were. I was worried that perhaps they had become too acclimated to humans and would no longer become releasable, which being acclimated to humans, especially in Vietnam, I mean, it's not good for any animal you want to release. So one thing I did to test to see if they were too friendly and had been acclimated was offer them insects directly from my hand and see if they would take it. And ones that passed it spectacularly was a particular pygmy loris that I offered her a stick insect and she growled at me and her male partner was silent, but he reared his head back. So in in prepping all of these animals to be released, did you get to see any of the loris releases? I was able to participate in the release of three pygmy slow lorises. In the process to release the slow lorises, one of the first things that we had to do was go out and find a suitable location. We released them into a national park. The park is a very big national park and there are good places to release the slow loris and there are bad places to release the slow mm-hmm. loris. And so one of the first steps we had to do was scout a good location So what we did was we took motorbikes into the national park and then we had to view a couple potential locations. A group of us would go and give our yay or nay whether or not we thought that where we were at was a suitable um, location. One of the things that we looked for for suitable locations or some of the things we looked for for suitable locations was um, the presence of, you know, Tree, gum trees, knowing that there were insects all about, that we weren't too close to the road, that we didn't see signs of tourist presence, um, that we were not too far from the ranger station, different things like that. After we found a suitable location, we moved an acclimation enclosure there that we set up and built to leave the loris in for a few days so that we are not just cold turkey dropping off the loris in a forest after they've spent their time at the EPRC. Um, so we set up this acclimation enclosure, feed them insects and gum and cucumbers for water for a few days to make sure that they're adjusting and healthy. And then after a few days, the most exciting part was heading out at nighttime on our motorbikes with our red lights and then hiking into the forest to the acclimation cage and then finally opening them up and setting them free. The It's always was super exciting to watch them leave. They would usually 
um, depending on the personality of Dolores, one of them immediately, as soon as the door opened, you know, led very quickly and got on a branch and climbed up right away. Um, one of the more nervous ones stayed in her the enclosure for a minute before he left on his way, but it was a really good feeling to be able to watch them after, you know, weeks of recording them at the EPRC and then days in their enclosure, um, watching them climb up the branches out into the forest. Um, it was a really good feeling. Yeah, well, that's, that sounds really wonderful, and I'm sure that they're very happy for your recommendations there. Um, so... We're doing this talk, and we're talking about slow lorises. Um, not that we don't talk about them every week, but especially this week because it's um, slow week, which is slow loris outreach week. So based on your experiences with slow lorises, what can people listening do to protect slow lorises um, or do to help them? Um, I guess there's a couple of things. If you want to be very epr EPRC specific, you can actually adopt animals. Um, you can actually go online on the EPRC and adopt a slow loris to help support its care and support their release efforts. Um, that's EPRC specific, of course. In general, what people can do is be a smart consumer, especially if you're someone who is planning on vacationing and a slow loris home range. So just something to be aware of if you want to help with their conservation and I mean many animals conservation is just be wary. Don't participate in photo props with touts. Don't buy animal products. Know before you go which animal products are okay and aren't okay to own. If you're someone who not looking to help specifically the EPRC, someone who's not planning on vacationing anywhere in Southeast Asia, one way that you can help just from your own home is by um, being aware of, being conscious of what you post on social media and the different things that you rebog, like, retweet, things like that. One of the things that led to an uptick in slow lorises being kept as pets in some countries is from some videos that were posted on YouTube advertising them as these cute pets where they showed video where there were videos from Russia and Japan of you know Loris with a little umbrella and or Loris being tickled and they get spread and liked and reblogged and they become popular and people are misled into believing that they're good pets or that they're not threatened with extinction in the wild and oftentimes when people do these things, such as like like and rebog photos and videos, they don't realize the harm that can happen behind such a simple gesture. Um, so just be wary of the media that you consume and that you put out there for other people and be conscious of the animals behind the cute pictures and videos that you're seeing. Thanks so much for listening to the Little Fireface podcast. This week, we're premiering one episode every day in honor of Slow Loris Outreach Week. So stay tuned and keep liking and sharing Slow Loris Outreach Week content on social media. We are at Little Fireface on Twitter and Instagram and Little Fireface Project on Facebook. To keep up with the Little Fireface podcast, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. To learn more about the Little Fireface Project, check out www.noctorama.org. Show off your own slow Laura's pride and let us know what you think of the Little Fireface podcast using the hashtag slow2019. The Little Fireface podcast is hosted and produced by me, Kylie Sorensen, with special thanks today to Brittany Rapone. Music by Pottington Bear.